Praise God. The Lord is good. Amen. Praise God. Welcome in the name of Jesus. It's good to be in the house of God. We thank you for those who braved the cold weather to be in our midst, some from further than others. <laughs> Praise God, but it's good to see you all. We welcome you at home as well. Um, I, will, I just want to read this verse. And it's just a simple verse that we know and we've all read so many times. But it's understanding it and truly living it. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor debt, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Why don't we stand? That is a, a love that we have been given, and nothing, nothing can take that away. That should bring a smile to our face. That should bring a joy to our spirit. So let's bow our heads and, and begin with prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night you've given us to gather in your name, Lord. Father, we know you are in our midst, Lord. Your word tells us where two or more are gathered in your name, you are in our midst. So, Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would just move freely in the midst of your people. Continue to cover those who are, are traveling, Lord. You, you bless those who are, are watching at home. And, Father, continue to bless those who are here in the midst, Lord. You just have your way with our hearts, Lord, and just fill us, Lord. Father, help us to give you the worship and praise that you are deserving of. And, Father, we just place this meeting in your hands with a godly excitement for all you have for us. Bless those who are, Father, afflicted. We continue to lift up our, our brother Marco, our sister Annie, our, our brother Reuben, many others who are afflicted. You know each one by name. Continue to touch them and strengthen them. And, Father, just bless this night. We thank you. We give you all praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship God. Let's go, let us go, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let us go, let us go, let us go into the house of the Lord. Where we can praise Him, we can worship the Lord, for He is worthy. He of the Lord. Let us go, let us go, let us go into the house where we can praise Him, where we can praise Him, where we can worship the Lord, for He is worthy, He is worthy of praise, for He has taken taken us he's taken us from death into life he's taken us from darkness into life Amen. what a fellowship what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms what a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting love. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting How sweet to walk in the pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path that grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Everlasting, what 
have I to dread? What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Meaning all the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord Savior. Meaning all the everlasting arms. From all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the leaning, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. But leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on His everlasting. Chains will hit the floor. 
broken lives restored We couldn't ask for more Here with you, here with you I'm running to the secret place Where you are, where you are, Lord I sing to you of all the ways Restore my heart, restore my heart just say amen help us run to you lord the words are easy to say lord but a lot of times it's hard to do lord to run to you god and just to trust in you your love your sovereignty god and we thank you tonight lord that you would speak to our hearts we pray that you would be blessed by our gathering we thank you for this time we all pray in jesus name amen praise god Praise God. The Lord is good. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Uh, tonight, on Wednesdays, we've been continuing through uh, Luke, and we're in chapter 11. But tonight, we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, first, um, Brother Regis shared on Sunday morning and really blessed us, and uh, he kind of left us hanging there a little bit kind of left us at the cliff and we want to find out a little more. He talked about the 10 points that he was going to make and then I think he gave us six. So we, we were left wondering for the rest of the message and I was truly blessed by it and I know that Brother wanted to, to share the remainder of those thoughts while they're fresh in our mind and our heart. So uh, we're going to take a, a break tonight from uh, Luke chapter 11 and Brother Regis is going to continue uh, in, uh, in the word that God gave him that he began on, on Sunday. Um, those who have come for the baptism class, um, Brother Daniel wasn't able to make it tonight, and we just felt instead of uh, continuing the class with, with myself or with someone else, we thought we would wait till next Wednesday uh, to begin the baptism class. So I apologize for that, but I do have homework for you. So I want to give you these verses. And those who are going to be sitting in the baptism class, it's in Romans chapter 6. And you know, we can go all the way, we can begin with verse 1. It's actually the second half of verse 2 where it speaks specifically of baptism, but Romans chapter 6, verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we, <clears throat> how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, and we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has a dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise God. So we've got verses 1 through 11. 
So that's truly, a, in a nutshell, uh, baptism. And I know that Brother Daniel has a, a thought that he's going to be sharing with you as well, and we may have a few other classes uh, beyond that as well. But have that uh, as, a, as a study item for the week, and uh, uh, we're going to continue again on Wednesday with the baptism class. So praise God. So with that, I don't believe there's any other announcements. So I'm going to go ahead and call Brother Regis forward at this time. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for um, being here tonight. And we just pray that, Lord, you would help us be attentive, God. I know we're tired, Lord. We had long days. We worked hard, Lord. Lord, we worked out in the community, Lord, different places. People worked at home, taking care of family. And, God, we're all in a different place tonight. We just pray, Lord, that as you as we open your word, that you would speak to us, God, and encourage us and challenge us and help us to um, keep our mind on you and stay connected to you, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It says in Isaiah 26, 4, I'll read this to you. It says, Trust in the Lord forever, for in him, Yah, the Lord, is everlasting strength. In verse 3, it says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Sunday we started talking about the, the idea of do you ever feel like you're losing your mind? Like you've lost your head. You've just lost your mind in, in, in the day that you have. It was funny because Sunday after sharing this message, I mean any brother or person that shares a word knows what happens. After you share a word or you share something with somebody, guess what happens? We all know, right? You go home or you go somewhere and you're challenged by that word. And there's challenges that come our way every single day. And the scripture says that really simply that we need to keep our mind, our thoughts on God and trust in him. And it's so easy to read that, but it's so hard to do. It's easy to feel like we're losing our mind, to losing our, our, our head. What does that mean? It means to, um, to feel like we're not thinking clearly, losing peace, hope, that we're not seeing things God's way. We we're start to lose it. We're not feeling like maybe a very good Christian. Reason, things don't make sense. We maybe start giving into panic and to fear easily blowing things out of proportion. I mean, you ever look at the world around you? Maybe not us, right? But the world, and you're like, man, they're just out of their mind. They're losing their mind, just the littlest thing. And 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 not me, not us, but others, we just completely can blow things out of proportion and, and just kind of like sometimes almost feel like we're going crazy. And it could be a, a sense of where like we just can't stand somebody. And maybe before it wasn't so bad. But as believers, it can mean losing our effectiveness, our, 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 excuse me, our zeal, our edge, our purpose, and, and even usefulness. And it can also mean on, on the extreme of going down into a place of loneliness and being disconnected not only from Christ but others around us. And, you know, in the worst case scenarios, people that actually kind of like lose their minds, mental health, I'm not any kind of expert on this, but you see them. I mean, you see them. They're completely like many of them disconnected from logic. And and it happens, I, I think, sometimes in a process. I'm not saying you guys are going that way or nothing, but, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm like, Lord, what is going on with me? You know, and in the book of First Kings, let's turn there, if you would. Chapter 6. There's a, a few verses here that share a little event that happened 
in the Old Testament times. And this was with the mighty man of God, Elisha. And in chapter 6, verse 1, it says, And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small. Please, let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there. Let us make there a place where we may dwell. And so he answered, Go. Oh, I'm sorry, this is Second Kings. Thank you. Chapter 6. Second Kings chapter 6. You're like, what Bible is we just reading? So we'll start back at verse 1. And the sons of the prophet said to Elijah, See now the place where we live, where we dwell, is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan. Let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we can dwell, where we can live. And so Elisha answered. He said, So he answered, Go. But then one of his students said, Please consent to come with us. Agree to go with your servants. And he answered, I'll go. I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water, into the, into the Jordan River. And he cried out, said, Alas, master, for it has been borrowed. So the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. And so he cut off a stick, Elisha did, and he threw it into the water, and he made the iron float, this iron axe head float. And therefore he said to him, Pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand. And took it, and so this is, um, you know, kind of like an interesting, simple little story about uh, this prophet of God, Elisha. He has a school where he's teaching these guys to serve God, to be prophets. <clears throat> where they live is too small, so they're like, "Hey, let's build a bigger place." So they go to the Jordan. Elijah goes with them. One of the guys is working. They're just you know, having a normal day. And it's interesting because, you know, so many scriptures in the Bible are like, um, you know, Jesus healed a blind person. Jesus raised a dead girl. Jesus turned water into wine, you know, miracle after miracle or Elisha, um, you know, called fire down or whatever it is. And, and this is just like a normal kind of like work day. Anybody have just normal kind of life, just normal work days, like, but maybe crazy work days, but just, this is, this is me. I, I go to work. I go home. I have a family. There's, I have church, you know, and, and I don't see myself like a mighty prophet, but just a guy with an, an ax, with an iron head, just trying to serve God, right? Just laboring our way. And that's this guy right here. And while he's doing this, we talked about, um, the first few things. The first thing is, is that doing something, something bad happened. That while he was doing something good, this guy serving God, working hard, not being lazy, something bad just happened. This borrowed axe head fell into the river and he freaked out. He lost his head because it was borrowed. He couldn't repay it. You know, there was going to be a penalty for this. And so the key thing here is that I don't know why, but we're always so surprised when we're trying to do good bad things happen and then it's like we start losing our head like you know what i'm trying to serve god and then these bad things happen around me or you know people treat me this way it's not worth it why am i going to keep doing this if i wasn't doing right or trying to be different i wouldn't have any problems right but we know that's not true but we're so surprised i'm surprised when things didn't go right i mean we should really be surprised when things go right and not you know when things are messed up i mean you know I don't know why I'm so surprised when I leave the house early in the morning. I'm tired and I get to work and like, I feel like people don't like me. I've been there forever, right? I'm like, it shouldn't bother me, but it does, you know? But it's, it's interesting because we shouldn't be surprised when these things happen. I'm not going to name all the verses and everything. I don't want to cover the whole message again, but you can watch the video from Sunday. The second thing is that unless we get involved, challenges won't come. So this guy, he was involved and challenges came. And by the challenges, there was growth. He was able to see God work in a mighty way. You know, I mean, it seems like a simple enough miracle, but it's a miracle that, you know, Elijah threw in the stick and the iron axe head floated. That just doesn't happen, you know. But unless we get involved in, in, in serving and in 
with our family, with church, with wherever God has us, unless we get involved, you know, challenges won't come and we won't grow. And, and, when we do get involved, challenges will come, and it's not easy. But God wants us to grow. I think there's a scripture that Pastor Mike just read in Romans 8. I think it was Romans 8. What is it? it says, we know that all things work together for God. But the, the verse says, the next verse says what that good thing is, and it's to make us like our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the goal. Is like when, that when we get to heaven, the Lord's just going to be like, man, you remind me of my son, Jesus. You know, over your life we just died to ourselves more and became more christ like the third thing was that when when these bad things happen when we start losing our head and feel like man i'm going crazy the situation happened i don't understand i'm frustrated i'm feeling like i'm going down i'm feeling like you know i can't repay i can't i can't handle this thing like that guy did he ran to he ran to Elijah and he was like, ah, oh, you got to help me last. The iron accent is in the water. I don't know what to do, you know? So third, we have to go to the right people when, we're fi- when we feel like we're losing it. We need to be connected to the right people. And, and for all of us, it might be different people, you know? I mean, it, it, it could be my wife. You know, I mean, sometimes I'm, I'm able to share with my kids, you know, depending on the circumstance or, or my father, he's a godly man, my father-in-law, you know, different people or friends or leaders or people that I know is the right person for that situation. And, and we have to be willing to reach out and make ourselves vulnerable because it's so easy to hide what we're going through. I mean, we don't want to walk around spilling our guts to everybody because <laughs> then they'll take our guts sometimes and throw them out in front of everybody, right? If you're going to spill your guts to somebody, make sure you spill it to the right person. I mean, the first one, obviously, is the Lord, right? we got to spill our guts to him and be like, Lord, this is where I'm at. I feel like I'm going crazy in my own life or in the world, these things that are going on. But God puts people around us also. You know, Paul, when he was writing in uh, his letters um, towards the end, he'd be like, hey, also, after he shared all this amazing like doctrine stuff and just things that I don't really fully understand all these things. He's like, oh, by the way, hey, um, can you please send somebody with my coat? I'm I'm cold. (laughs) Can you please send some some scrolls, some, you know. Can you can you send my friend so and so to encourage me? Like he reached out and he shared his heart and so often we I think I do. We do. We keep these things in us. You know, even Jesus in the garden, he told his disciples, "Hey, can you just hang out with me for 1 hour? Can you just you know like I need you." Jesus is like Sharon's heart, like, "Hey." So, it's very easy to just keep those things to ourself and so it's our responsibility it's my responsibility to find out who those people are in our lives to find out who they are and to go to them and to go to god so when um we feel like we're losing it we need to make sure we go to the right person and not just let it stay buried if he didn't go to elijah that axe head would have stayed buried and it just sits there and you know what you know what would have happened to it First, loss of usefulness. Second, he, he, he couldn't be effective. He couldn't help the people. Everybody around him were working hard. He, he's not contributing to the project. He's, not, he's feeling like, what am I doing here? I'm just wasting my time, everybody else. And what happens to that iron in there? It's just rusting and degrading and you know, just becoming useless. So we need to make sure we do that. Number four. Um, is that he lost the axe head, he had to repay it. So what we have is borrowed, and we have to give an account for it. And and we need to realize that our the lives that we have are not our own. It's not me. I've been bought with the price. You know, I don't deserve anything. I can't feel entitled, even though I always feel entitled. Like, you know, why are they treating me this way? Why are they doing that? Why am I not getting this? Why is this happening to me? Just this sense of entitlement instead of realizing, like, Lord, man, you've given me this life. Thank you. Thank you for my, my family. Thank you for my church. Lord, thank you for this. It's borrowed. I want to do what I can for you, Lord. doesn't mean that we're not going to have times where the 
where the axe head, where we lose our head, where we start kind of, and it's just sitting there for a little bit of time, you know, a little reflective time, a little time out, like, man, you know, I should have made sure it was tied on there. I don't know what happened, you know, but eventually God wants to get us out of that. And, and he wants us to, um, be sure that, Hey, we, we, we live our lives. We serve in such a way where we realize that what we have is borrowed and that we're going to even give an account for it. And number five was that, um, Eli Elisha told him, Hey, well, where did it fall? And he's like, I don't know, somewhere over there. You know, I don't know exactly but over there was that he had to go back where they lost that ax head, where he lost the head, his head, he had to go back. And so that could simply mean, you know, if, if we realize, I mean, like for me, I shared a little bit, like I, I realize that I start losing my mind, my head, my heart, my zeal, my effectiveness when I'm honestly, when I'm paying a little bit too much attention to what's going on around me in the world, when I'm like listening a little bit too much to the news, when I'm getting a little bit too much emotionally involved in those things, listen, you know what the world, this is the best that they have. You know, God's not political and, and they, we know that this world has all kinds of systems. I mean, I think, you know, probably for the most recent history, we've probably been blessed with the best one, but it feels like it's changing and there's just so much chaos. But so for me, when I start feeling that way and I start getting like, feeling crazy and like I don't care about people I need to go back to where I was at and so for me that's um, just simple things I mean get try to read some some of the word pray be around brethren spend time with family serve you know that's something that's important you know to me in my life I think it should be all of us it's important but doing those things you know and, and not giving up on that so go back to where we lost our head also I shared about uh, what we're listening to for me, it really ministers to me to listen to like worship music and, you know, um, you know, we used to do youth ministry years ago with Javi Amanda, my wife and stuff. And so sometimes I'm just feeling down or Kathy and I will just listen to some old like um, Christian rock from the 90s, like audio adrenaline and, uh, you know, switch foot and just different stuff that during the time just lifted us up. And we're like, you're the same God. So for you, that might mean going back to the 70s and listen to uh, Praise 1 and 2 and 3 or something, you know. Um, but it doesn't really matter. If it's lifting your spirit up, clearing your mind, bringing you back into focus on Christ, on what he asked for you, then that's where you need to go back to, like it says in the book of Ephesians, going back to first love. All right, number six. I touched on this a little bit. And in light of all the verses surrounding this verse with the axe head falling into the water, this just seems like such an unimportant thing. It just seems so unimportant. I mean, before that, there's the whole story about Naaman being cleansed of leprosy and going into the Jordan and all that. And then the whole thing with Gehazi. And then after this ax head incident, there's this whole thing where the Syrian army comes in and they get blinded. And there's just all these crazy big miracles that happen. But right in between of all this crazy big stuff, this little work incident happens. And God cares about the small things. And Matthew 10, 29 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? The very head, hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. Therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. I mean, this is Jesus talking and it's a verse that we know and kids memorize and stuff. And he's like, He's all, think about the, the little flowers, the little birds. He's all, the very hairs of your head are numbered. I'm like, I don't think about that. I'm like, oh, Jesus, that was just a really nice poetic thing that you said about like, I, you know, I mean, for some people, it's easier to count the hair, but like for others, it, it's difficult. You know, you're like, how many hair do you have on your head? I mean, like, is Jesus just speaking? Is he just wasting time just or does he really mean it? Like God really cares about us. The very little things. And then, 
and also in light of that, Jesus said he was faithful in what is least is faithful in also much. He who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you trust of true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? See, I mean, God cares about us and and what we would think is like, I mean, for me, it might be a big thing. But it really, in reality, it's probably maybe a little thing, right? But God cares about that. He does. But he also cares that we care about what we think is little, unimportant. Jesus said, if, if we can't care about little things, about being faithful in little areas in our lives, he's all, why is God going to trust us with more? And so the point is this, is that, you know what, it's so easy to compare ourselves to people around us. It's so easy to be like, well, look what they're doing. You know, wow, they got this. And and you and I might just be sitting there feeling like, man, I'm just, I'm like a stick with no ax head on my head on, on it. I'm just like, you know, waste, beating, beating the bush, wasting my time. God's like, no, we all have to be responsible for whatever God puts in our hands. We have to be faithful to that. So that means, you know, our our family, our wife, our husband, our kids, our church, our grandkids, our our ministry. If if you're working, wherever you're working, if you're going to school, that that's your ministry right there in serving and being faithful in those things. It all matters to God. And and as we do that, he will enrich us with more. He in James one twenty seven, because a lot of times we're like, Well, Lord, what do you want me to, what's important? James one twenty seven says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I mean, think about it. Like I see the world around me, I want to change everything. And you know what? For some people, for some Christians, their calling might be to try and change something in culture or in politics or something. But I don't think I'm called to that. But it drives me crazy. But right here, he's, God's like, he didn't say that. He's all, I want you to care about hurting people. That's what matters to me. Orphans, widows, people that are hurting, destitute. I mean, if we all did that, I mean, imagine this world would be awesome, right? But we, we're not because this world's lost. And there's just, you know, few, not just us, but believers around the world that are, we're trying to do that and, and to stand spotted from the world so that we need to be faithful in the small things. We should care about the small things because God does too. He cares about the trouble that you and I are going through, through the difficulties he, he's a loving father. He loves us. Seven, when we're doing God's work, we can become dull and lose our effectiveness. Sometimes there's fear, disappointment, tiredness, and feelings of uselessness that, that come into our lives. And, you know, sometimes we start, we can feel guilty about it. Can feel like, well, why is this happening? What, you know? But I think if we were all honest with one another, we'd be like, yeah, I go through that too. It's like Jesus, when it says that he knows what we go through because he became a human, a man like us. He too, even though he was, he didn't sin, but he was tempted by sin. He knows our weaknesses, the things that we go through. Elisha's teacher was Elijah. And it's interesting because in the book of 1 Kings, you can read all these verses on your own. Um, we know the story about him being on Mount Carmel. And the the children of Israel, they were worshiping Baal. Um, Ahab married, you know, this ungodly um, woman, Jezebel, and she brought in the Baal, Baal worship. And so what happened on Mount Carmel was that all the prophets of Baal, 450 of them, they came, they tried to sacrifice. We know the story, right? That nothing happened. Elijah prayed to God. Fire came down from heaven and, and, 
and God just showed himself to everybody. It was just this awesome, like, highlight, this miracle thing that happened, right? And then uh, Elijah, he's like, you know, kills 450 prophets of Baal and just like this revival thing that happens. And then what happens in verse 19? Ahab goes and tells his wife Jezebel. She's, she's a pretty tough lady. And she said, send this mes message to Elijah. I'm going to kill him. And what happens to Elijah? It says, verse 3, And when he saw that he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, Elijah ran. He ran to this cave. We'll just read some of the verses here. Chapter 19, verse first King. After this mighty miracle, in verse 3 it says, When he saw that, he arose and he ran for his life, and he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. He went alone there. He's left his servant. He ditched him, his servant. Can you imagine the servant's like, what am I supposed to do? Like, where are you going? We just did this cool thing. God was like awesome. And I'm like, you're ditching me now. You're running. I don't get it. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed there that he might die. And he said, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. It's like he was there after this amazing thing that happened. It seems like he's losing his head, like he's losing his mind. Like he wasn't thinking clearly. Like you and I, we read this and we're like, dude, what's wrong with you? Just call fire down and burn her up. <laughs> I'm sure God would have did it. But that's not what happened here. He had just defeated all these prophets, but now this nasty woman says what she says because she had power in that in the country of Israel. And it freaks him out. It scares him. In, in a play by William Congreve, The Morning Bride, he said, Hell hath no fury like love to hatred turn, nor hell a fury like a warm woman scorned. You know, she, she was mean. She was angry. Think about it, too. You know, when maybe things happen, you know, we become that way. And she was that way. And so he, he ran. And he's like, God, just let me die. I just want to die now. I'm done. It's enough. I am no better than my father's. I'm useless. I've lost my effectiveness, my edge. I'm just over this. And then as he lay in verse 5 and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat, get up. And then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. And so he ate and drank and lay down again. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's amazing. We could be in the middle of something and something good happens and we don't even, like, it doesn't even phase us. Like, we're so down, so down in the situation that something good can happen, like, from God. And it's just like, I didn't even... He's laying there asleep and an angel comes and give him this food in, in the desert and this awesome, I'm sure, refreshing water because we know God doesn't is not like going to be like, here, drink this dirty water, Elijah. Probably, it was so probably good, you know. I mean, the Lord sent the angel to like Switzerland and get some sparkling water and take it to him or something, you know. And Elijah just wakes up, eats it, and goes back to sleep. He's not like, oh, wow, this is crazy. And then... In verse 7, and the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights, far as Horeb, the mountain of God, like another 200 miles down. A, a second time, the angel wakes him up and here, eat this food and stuff. And you see, like, like Jesus, like we talked about in the boat, where he's just like so full of compassion towards his children, towards towards everyone, but especially his kids. And he's like, he's like, why are you afraid? I'm here for you. I love you. I'm like, Lord, because I'm I'm afraid. 
And he's all, here, eat this, because the journey is too great. Like, the journey, the road just seemed long and hard. And it was going to be long and hard there, because he had to go 200 miles away where, where God was leading him there. See, God knows that, hey, you know, sometimes in our life, I mean, this is hard. It's not easy. We get tired. We get beat up, beat down every day. And the Lord sees it. And so he rose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength. Verse 9 says, And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place, and behold, the word of the Lord. So now he's spending, uh, this is a third time he's sleeping. This guy was exhausted. He was tired, probably depressed from some of the things that we could read here, just wanting to shut out the world around him. But the word of the Lord came to him while he was in that cave, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? You know, this kind of reminds me of when Jesus would escape after a long day of ministering to a bunch of knuckleheads, right? All day long, to feeding a bunch of people, to doing all these miracles. Not that Jesus was angry or frustrated with people, but just tired. He needed to reconnect with his father. He needed to rest. He, he, he would get away. He would go in, in, into the, the garden. He would go into the back of the ship and just sleep. But Elijah, he was in a different place than that. As we read the scriptures, there's, a, there's fear. There, I think there's a sense of disappointment in him. Like, well, why wasn't Jezebel converted? Why didn't the whole kingdom turn back to God after these miracles? Tiredness, feelings of use, uselessness, crying out, Lord, I'm worthless. I've been trying so hard and I'm, I just feel worthless. He loses his, his head here. I was trying to think why. It's interesting because that is so important to us. Is why am I at, why am I where I'm at? Why am I here? Well, the why I got was this. He was human. I mean, he was human. He was susceptible to human weaknesses. You know, to tiredness, hunger, to different feelings and emotions. I mean, God made us human. And he was human. And this is encouraging because if the mighty man of God, Elijah, would go through this, why am I surprised when I go through these things? I mean, why am I surprised when I, I feel like, man, what did I do today? I lost it. I got upset. I got angry. I, don't, I can't stay focused. I don't know what's going on, Lord. I feel so far away from you sometimes. He was human, and that's encouraging because we are too. But in verse 9, the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, What? Not, Why are you here, Elijah? Why did you do this? Why are you hiding here? Why aren't you with your servant? Why, aren't, like you know, why when you think about it is a word for blame. Blame. And he's not trying to put any blame. He's all, "What are you doing here, Elijah?" What is an action word? It means what what actions are you doing right now? Like what is going on? What are you doing here? Are. This this is a word, verb, means to be. It means who I am right now. Like, Elijah, what's going on in you right now? Not yesterday at the mountain and not tomorrow who you're going to be, but right now. And he asked you, what are you doing here, Elijah? Not pointing to someone else, not saying, well, you know, it was Jezebel and she sent me and she freaked me out and I lost my head or Ahab, that guy's, you know, just, I can't believe it. He was there. He saw everything that happened, but he's the one and he told his wife and, you know, the children of Israel and my servant, like, I don't know, you know, but the Lord's like, no, 
Elijah, you have responsibility for where you're at right now. And, and he asked him, what are you doing? This is encouraging because he's not like, hey, what did you do or what are you going to do? I care about this very moment right now between you and me. And he says, here, what are you doing here? Kind of challenging him like, hey, is this where I want you right now at this moment? Is here where God wants me? Is here where God wants you? And that's the crazy thing because I'll be like, you know, at work or a certain place and I'm like, oh, I'm wasting my time here. I feel like, well, then what am I doing there then? I mean, if that's not where I'm supposed to be, then I should figure out where God wants me to be and go to that place. But if I'm here and it's where God wants me to be, then I should have more peace knowing that he's going to use me. He's going to work in my life. He's, he's, he's got a purpose in it. And the encouraging thing through all this is that the Lord, again, like Jesus with the disciples, he, he rebukes the wind and the fire, and, uh, the wind and the waves, but he, he, he challenges the disciples and encourages them, but he doesn't like just give it to them. And he doesn't do that to Elijah and these. You could finish reading the last verses here on your own time, 11 through um, 18. But, you know, the Lord is just like reaching out to him and saying, man, I, I'm here. I'm here right now for you. And so um, when we're doing God's work, we can become dull and our effective, lose our effectiveness. And it happens. So we need to be careful. Maybe it might just be rest. You know, it might just be we need to figure out a time of rest. I don't think, I, I think we're all guilty of probably trying to stretch the day so thin and not getting enough rest. I mean, God, if he didn't want us to find some rest, he would have made us like not have to sleep and rest. So we need to make sure that we do those things. Some people might sleep too much, though. Um, <laughs> number eight is that the back in Kings is that when he, when Elijah raised this axe head, just like any other thing that God does, that God will get glory when he raises your head. In Luke chapter 22, 31 through 34, and the Lord said to him, Jesus said to him, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has, has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, in other words, Simon Peter was going to lose his head. He was going to betray Jesus. He, his heart was, was not going to have enough courage to stand up for his friend and Savior Jesus Christ, right? And Simon would do that, just like maybe we would. But he says, after that, after your head is raised, after I've brought you back, you've returned to me. Strengthen your brethren. Encourage them. See, God will use the times when we feel like we're losing it and, and he reconnects us back to the body. He reconnects us back to himself. He will use those times to, to help us, use us to encourage other people to strengthen other people and to bring him glory through those things. You know, well, how did you get through that? You know, God took me through it. So it's not wrong for us to feel that way at times, I don't believe. It's not wrong for us to feel any of these things that Elijah, uh, Elisha felt. But when God brings us back and raises our head up, he'll get the glory for those things. And number nine we talked about on Sunday that when, we, when, when you lose your head, don't lose your heart. Losing our heart means, you know, like losing our purpose, our hope and stuff. You know, this guy, when the axe head went in there, he, he figuratively, you know, lost it in there or literally. But if he had lost his heart, he would have been like, I'm never going to get that thing back. Man, I'm done. But in his heart, there was hope because he knew what God could do. What he had seen what uh, God could do through Elijah. So he had hope. He didn't lose his heart. And we read some of these scriptures that um, Jesus said in Luke 18, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Second Corinthians 4, since we have this ministry, we have received mercy. Because we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. 
Second Corinthians 4.16 says, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is re being renewed day by day. And then finally, it, in, in relation to this, Galatians 6.9 says, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. You know, in the day and age that we live in, we, we don't want to lose heart. We might feel like there's times we're losing our head, we're losing our mind, like, man, Lord. But we need to stay connected to Christ because in Him, we will not lose our mind, we will not lose our heart. And the Scripture says, in the last days, because of the craziness in the world, the increase of wickedness, that the love of many will grow cold. And I think that's probably my my one of my great struggles, you know, it, where I'm at in life right now. And is that I'm like, Lord, please don't let your love in me grow cold. I don't want to grow cold towards you, Lord, or towards the people around me or towards the, the lost, towards those that need your love, Lord. So and then finally, number 10 is that God revealed where it was. But but the one that lost the head had to reach out and pick it up. What does that mean? Well, you know, it was in the water, it was hidden, and when God brought it back up again, Elijah told him, he said, you pick it up. You know, I think for dramatic effect, I think it would have been like, I mean, I don't know if you've ever done it. I don't have any, but, you know, like, <laughs> I won't say my wife. I don't think it's happened, but somebody misplaces something, the keys or whatever, and you're like, oh, they're over there. And for dramatic effect, it's like, they're right here, <laughs> dummy. You know, like, hey, you know, I think for I think if Eli Elisha had went and picked it up and been like, here you go. Like, that would have been, like, cool. Like, oh, man, that was cool. That was a cool miracle. Yeah. But that wasn't what it was about. That's not what it was about. He went in to encourage the guy. Hey, let's keep working. Let's keep serving. I know you, you lost your head here in the river. God raised it up. And now, but you need to be the one that reaches out and picks it up. In Micah 6, 6 through 8, it says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with a calf a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He's saying, what does God want from me? You know, does he, does he want me to just bow down in this kind of religious demonstration of honor, bring sacrifices to him? 10,000 rams, offerings, rivers of oil to sacrifice my firstborn son from, for my sin. And then Micah says in verse 8, No, he's shown you, man, what's good and what God wants from you to do justly, to live in a way that's right and just towards others to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. You know, he's shown us. He hasn't made it difficult for us. It's, it's like He's like, it's like it's right there. But it's, I don't, I don't know. Maybe the guy had to walk out into the water a little ways. I mean, it's in the Jordan River. Maybe, you know, he's, I mean, if it had been just right there, he could probably just pick it up. Maybe it was deeper. Like where people get baptized, you know, in immersion. And Elisha's all, now you go get it. And I don't want to get wet. I don't want to get dirty in the Jordan like Naaman. But he had a part to do. He had a part where he had to humble himself and go and do the, the thing that God showed him to do. And sometimes we're like feeling like we're losing it. And it's because we're not just doing the simple things that God has shown us to do. And one more verse, Colossians 3, 12 through 17 says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Put up with one another, 
Forgive one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. Verse 14, but of, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And verse 17, finally, and whatever you do, Whatever your hand finds to do, reaching it out, reaching out to pick up that lost head, that edge, that our mind. Whatever you do in your words or your deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. We must do the task at hand. It might seem small. It might seem insignificant. It's not. To God, it matters. You might feel small. You might feel insignificant. The things that you're going through and that I go through oftentimes feel like they don't matter. They do to the Lord. He cares for us. He loves us. So I pray this encourages you and challenges you. I know it does me. So thank you, Pastor Mike. God bless you. Praise God. The Lord is so good. He knows what we need. He knows when we need it. And even as, you know, you always feel like God's talking to you. <laughs> felt like, I felt like Brother Regis was going, are you getting this? <laughs> it was the Holy Spirit of my own heart just, just receiving. And uh, how we have to understand and really look at our circumstances what kept continually going through my mind was what are you doing here with the what and how he explained the what so uh, so beautifully to show as an action word. And we have to go back to the place where the struggle began. Many of us are going through struggles. This whole world is going through struggles if we're being honest about it. Because if we look back, even something as easy as two years ago, things were different. If we were in the midst of a storm two years ago, then go back three, four. If things were great two years ago, <laughs> or a year ago even. But going back to where we figuratively lost our head. The headless axeman, not the headless horseman. And he was told, pick it up for yourself. Because he had to regain where he was. It was placed on him. It, it, it's, it's kind of a, it's not kind of, it's a complete teaching lesson to say, if he would have been given that axe head and pat it on the head here you go mijo be careful next time you're swinging it no he said grab it pick it up right where you were at and continue it. remember what god is doing that god is using you remember god has a plan and sometimes we don't feel like we're still in the midst of his plan because we lose that axe head i know how simple it can be when you feel like you're giving all you got just to swing the axe. I don't have an ounce more of strength to swing this axe any harder. And now the axe head fell off. I, I can't even continue this with giving everything. And now what, am I going to go swim for that thing? And how God shows us, he's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his plan will never change. He is able. And as Brother Regis shared when we start to get so caught up with the things around us, we start getting wound up in, in the problems and the concerns and the worries of this world, we become so heavy laden. And if we weren't tired before, you watch the news and then you just feel, you feel like a million pounds on your shoulders. You start seeing all these different things. And if there's not enough problems, they'll make up problems that could be coming. <laughs> and then this could actually happen. And this could. And 
But we have to remember who is still on the throne. And as Brother Rita shared, staying connected and being used. And how do we do that? As he, as he shared also, being together. Seeking God's face first and foremost. Laying our worries, our cares at the foot of the cross. And doing good to those of the house of God. And to all, but especially those in the house of God. If we, two years ago, would have thought you were crazy if you said, I'm not going to go to church tonight. But tonight, it wasn't even a thought to come. Examine your heart. Think about it. Those who are here, we're here and God has blessed us and given us this word. Receive it and use it as fuel. God has given this, this encouraging word. I know this has lifted up my heart tremendously. This, this has blessed me tremendously. Because like I said, God knows what each one of us need to hear. And he knew which portions he had to, on the back of the head to me, okay, Lord, sorry. <laughs> I wanted to stand there and stomp for a little while longer and be upset and say, but, but how am I? But, but, God says, don't say but. Don't worry about those things. I'm on the throne. So with that, I, I apologize. I don't want to take away from what was shared. I just, it just, I just get excited when the Holy Spirit is moving like that and God gives us such a good word. So I'm going to call the musicians forward. And I'm going to ask you to stand. And as always, we want to give time for prayer. And if anyone has a desire to ask the Lord just to bring them back to that axe head, if they want to examine your heart to say, what am I doing right now? Where do you have me, Lord? And what do you desire of me? We can come forward and we can pray. Praise God. Let's, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for it is true. Father, we thank you for the strength and encouragement only your Holy Spirit can give. And Father, through your word, Father, you guide your people. Father, we know you are still on the throne. Father, we know all things are in your hands. But Lord, when we are weary in our day, when we are just over, heavy laden with the things that we see before our eyes, Father, forgive us, Lord, when our faith becomes weak. But Lord, strengthen that faith, Lord. We submit to you, Lord, this night, Father, even our hearts, and ask that you would just continue to deal with us, Lord. Strengthen us and draw us close to you. Bless your people in a special way tonight. Father, anyone that desires to come, you minister to them in a special way, Lord. You touch them, Father, even through the words of those who will be praying for them. And we just thank you for this meeting. We, we just put this time of prayer in your hands. We just ask your beautiful will to be done. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. The altar is open. If there's anyone that desires prayer, you come. The leaders will pray with you. Praise God. If not, we can worship God where we stand. Where will you run my soul? Where will you go when wells run dry? When the wind starts to blow, how are you going to keep this flame alive? In the fading light when night is breaking, You are my only hope You 
are the rock on which I stand. You will not let me go. I know that I'm safe inside your hands. In the face. thinking about uh, Regis. He's my son-in-law. And many, many, a few years back, he was a teenager, a young boy. And I remember uh, we used to be part of uh, my, my wife and I would help the youth. We would take the youth here and there. And um, I, I, I don't say this to embarrass him in any way, but uh, we took a lot of young boys to the ocean to go swimming. They wanted to go. And Regis was one of them, and uh, I remember we were swimming, and then there was one young fella that needed some help, and my wife says, one of the boys is in trouble, you gotta help him. And I looked over, I said, oh, it's, it's only a riches, but I said something else. And then I forgot, I said, oh my gosh, he was the only young Anglo person in the, in, in, out of everybody, he was the only one. <laughs> and I said, oh my gosh, he's part of my ministry. I started running out there, but then the uh, lifeguards went out there and helped him out. <laughs> but he was always the one that I had, I had to keep an eye, uh, keep an eye on. And, uh, and I was thinking about that. I said, wow, how God is so good because he's behind the pulpit and sharing the word of God with uh, a lot of uh, discernment, and uh, it's amazing what God can do in our lives. And I, I just say amen to the message. And I don't say that to embarrass him. He, he knows me. He knows that I don't, I don't do that. So let us, let us pray. Father, I just thank you. I appreciate the leaders of this church, Father, the word of God that you have put in their hearts to share with us, Lord. And we, we want to not just be saying that that was a good message, but we want to put the message to, to in practice, Father God. It was easy to hear it, 
but it's work to put it to practice. So, Father, you use us. We want to be like that, that prophet that you, you, you raised up that axe, Father. And you said, grab it and go on forward. And we want to do that, Lord, in our lives, at work, wherever you have us, Father. We want to do that, Father. I pray that you bless everyone of us here present, Lord, and those that are watching at home. Bless them. Heal those that are going through afflictions. Touch them. You bless your people, Lord. Bless Pastor Mike, especially Richard tonight. It was his message. And uh, you bless them, Father. And be with us as we go home. We ask it in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.